Porjan Hussain, Assistant Professor of English at Sunada Degree College, Darjeeling. And over the next couple of lectures, I am going to uh, be teaching you the poem Goblin Market, uh, which I've already discussed, the background to which I've already discussed in my last lecture by Christina Rossetti. Um, these lectures are being made available to you, courtesy Radio Solution 90.8 FM. So this is the third part of Goblin Market and I we have already seen in our last lecture how um, Laura, she eats the forbidden fruit and she will now begin to waste away. So let us continue after that. Golden head by golden head, both of them have golden hair. So golden head by golden head, like two pigeons in one nest, folded in each other's wings, they lay down in their curtained bed. Like two blossoms on one stem, like two flakes on a new fallen snow, like two wands of ivory, tipped with gold for awful kings. Moon and stars gazed in at them, wind sang to them lullaby, lumbering owls forebore to fly, not a bat flapped to and fro round their rest, cheek to cheek and breast to breast, locked together in one nest. So this is an image of sisterly love. Many feminist critics will also this interpret this as an example of homoerotic or lesbian love, as we'll also see in the end of the poem. Early in the morning, when the first cock crowed its warning, neat like bees and sweet as and busy, Laura rose with Lizzie, fetched in honey milk the cows, aired and set to rights the house, Nedded cakes of whitest wheat, cakes for dainty mouths to eat. Next churned butter, whipped up cream, fed their poultry, sat and sewed, talked as modest maidens should. Lizzie with an open heart, Laura in an absent dream. So she is already lost in the world of the goblins. She is absent minded now. One content, one sick in part, one warbing for the mere bright day's delight, one longing for the night. Okay, once again, the image of day and night is interesting. Okay, the goblin men come at night. Okay, so this should tell you that the symbol of the night itself is telling as night is the time when uh, all kinds of evil things can happen. At length, slow evening came. They went with pitchers to the reedy brook. Lizzie most placid in her look, Laura most like a leaping flame. They drew the gurgling water from its deep. Lizzie plucked purple and rich golden flags. Then turned homeward, said, The sunset flushes, those furthest loftiest crags. Come, Laura, not another maiden lags. No willful squirrel wags. The beasts and birds are fast asleep. But Laura loitered still among the rushes and sat and said, said the bank was steep. Okay, so Laura is loitering. Why? Because she's waiting once again for the goblin men to come and give her the fruit. And said the hour was early still, the dew had not fallen and would not chill. Listening ever but not catching the customary cry, come by, come by. With its iterated jingle of sugar-baited words, not for all her watching, once discerning even one goblin racing, whisking, tumbling, hobbling. So, she does not see any goblins. Okay, the goblins do not come today. And look at what happens to her later. I'm just skipping a bit. Laura turned cold as stone to find her sister heard that cry alone, that goblin cry, come by our fruits, come by. Must she then buy no more such dainty fruit? Must, must she no more such succus pasture find, gone deaf and blind? Her tree of life drooped from the root. See, she said not one word in her heart's sore ache, but peering through the dimness, not discerning, trudged home, her pitcher dripping all the way, and crept to bed and lay, silent till Lizzie slept. Then sat up in a passionate yearning, and gnashed her teeth for balked desire, and wept as if her heart would break. Once again, one, Lizzie is asleep, Laura is waking up, and she's full of yearning, she's full of desire, and she's yearning for the goblin men. Once again, these are very, very suggestive lines. As you read through to them, you will know that there are layers and layers of meaning. Day after day, night after night, Laura kept watch in vain. In sullen silence of exceeding pain, she never caught again the goblin cry, come by, come by. So the goblin men do not come anymore. She never spied the goblin men hawking their fruits along the glen. But when the noon waxed bright, her hair grew thin and grey. And she is becoming like that other girl, Jeannie. Her hair is becoming grey. So she is wasting away and dying. She dwindled as the fair moon, as, as the fair full moon doth turn to swift decay and burn her fire away. One day, remembering her kernel stone, she set it by a wall that faced the south, dewed it with tears, hoped for a root, watched for a waxing shoot, but there came none. 
it never saw the sun it never felt the trickling moisture run while with some guys and faded mouth she dreamed of melons as a traveler sees false waves in a desert drought with shade of leaf crown trees okay so she is dreaming she keeps the kernel stone the seed and she waters it but no fruits are born by it no tree comes out of it and she desires and desires like in a desert you dream of a mirage she is dreaming of the sound and the sight of the goblin men she no more swept the house no more tended the fowls or cows fetched honey kneaded cakes of wheat brought water from the brook but sat down listless in the chimney nook and would not eat so she gives up eating and she sits in the corner of the chimney tender lizzy could not bear to watch her sister's cankerous care cankerous means you become fidgety cankerous okay chid chid yet not to share she night and morning caught the goblins cry come by our orchard fruits come by come by beside the brook along the glen she heard the tramp of goblin men the yo can stir poor laura could not hear now this is very interesting the goblin men are coming every day so they are like magical evil creatures okay but only lizzy who has not yet eaten their fruit only she can hear the goblin men laura cannot hear them any more so once she has entered the world of experience and once again this is a biblical references here once adam and eve have been thrown out of paradise you can no longer reclaim paradise still of course jesus comes as the sacrificial figure and redeems mankind okay i'll just be explaining that bit later so only lizzy can hear the sound of the goblin men laura cannot hear them any more Okay, now what does Lizzy do? She has to save her sister. Okay, till Laura dwindling seemed knocking at death's door. Then Lizzy waited no waited no more. Better and worse, but put a silver penny in her purse. Kissed Laura, crossed the heath with clumps of firs at twilight, halted by the brook, and for the first time in her life began to listen and look. So Lizzy goes out in search of the goblin men to buy the fruit for her sister. Laughed they every goblin when they spied her peeping, came towards her hobbling, flying, flying, running, leaping, puffing and blowing, chucking, chuckling, clapping, crowing, clucking and gobbling, mopping and mowing, full of airs and graces. Okay, and now you will see that they do not want to give Lizzie the fruit. Okay, good folk said Lizzie, mindful of Jeanie. So she remembers Jeanie. What happened to Jeanie? You also remember what happened to Jeanie, who wasted away and died, and no flower would grow where she fell down into the earth. Give me much and many. Held out her apron, so she holds out an apron and apron and asks for the fruit of the goblin men. Toss them her penny. Nay, take a seat with us. Honor us and eat with us. They answered, grinning. Our feast it but is but beginning. So they refuse to give her fruit, and they are saying, Come, you have to sit with us. You have to eat with us. You have to join us. Our feast is just beginning. Night yet is early, warm and dew purely, wakeful and starry. Such fruits as these no man can carry. Okay. So thank you," she said Lizzie. But one waits at home alone for me. So Lizzie saying, "I cannot join you. Just give me the fruit. Someone is waiting at home for me." So without further parley, any more banter. If you will not sell me any of your fruits, though much and many, give me back my silver penny. I tossed you for a fee. They began to scratch their pates, no longer wagging, purring, but visibly demurring, grunting and snarling. One called her proud, cross-grained, uncivil. Their tones waxed loud. Their looks were evil. Lashing their tails, they trod and hustled her, elbowed and jostled her, clawed with their nails, barking, mewing, hissing, mocking, tore her gown and soiled her stocking. Twitched her hair out by the roots, stamped upon her tender feet, held her hands and squeezed their fruits against her mouth to make her eat. And this is a, this is. Almost like you know the way it's being written here, the suggestions of rape, and it's almost they're forcing her to eat. They're tearing her gown. They're you know tearing her hair by the roots, and they're trying to push the goblin fruits into her mouth. White and golden Lizzie stood like a lily in a flood, like a rock of blue veined stone lashed by tides obstreperously, like a beacon left alone in a hoary roaring sea. Uh, one may lead a horse to water. Twenty cannot make her drink. Make him drink, though the goblins scuffed and caught her, coaxed and fought her, bullied and besought her, scratched her, pinched her black as ink, kicked and knocked her, mauled and mocked her. Lizzie uttered not a word. And Lizzie is the ideal of purity, of chastity. She does not open her mouth, and she does not eat the goblin fruit. Okay. She would not open lip from lip, lest they should cram a mouthful in. Once again, these lines are loaded with these lines are loaded with sexual imagery. But laughed in heart to feel the drip of juice that syrupped all of her face, and lodged that and lodged in dimples of her chin, and streaked her neck with quake, which quaked like curd. At last, the evil people, worn out by her resistance, 
flung back her penny, kicked their fruit along whichever road they took, not leaving root or stone or shoot. Some writhed into the ground, some dived into the brook with ring and ripple, some scudded on the gale without a sound, some vanished in the distance. Okay, so because she does not eat the fruit, they try to push the fruit in her mouth and the juices are dripping, kicked like curd all over her body. And I told you, there are sexual suggestions here. And there's a suggestion that Lizzie is almost raped and abused by the goblin men. In a smart egg tingle, Lizzie went her way, knew not whether it was night or day, sprang up the bank, towed through the furs, threaded corpse and dingle and heard her penny jingle bouncing in her purse. She ran and ran as if she feared some goblin man dogged her with jibe or curse or something worse. Okay. Then she goes home. <laughs> She cried, Laura up the garden, did you miss me? Come and kiss me. Never, never mind my bruises. Hug me, kiss me, suck my juices. Squeezed from goblin fruits for you, goblin pulp and goblin dew. And here is where many feminist critics will interpret this as a sort of example of homoeroticism or lesbianism when the sister will lick the body of the sister and lick the juice from the sister's body. Goblin pulp and goblin dew, eat me, drink me, love me. So these are the lines which are very, very suggestive. Okay. Eat me, drink me, love me. Laura, make much of me. For your sake, I have braved the glen and had to do with much with goblin merchant men. Laura started from her chair, flung her arms in the air, clutched her hair. Lizzie, Lizzie, have you tasted for my sake the fruit forbidden? So there's a direct reference here. Forbidden fruit, fruit of the forbidden tree from the Bible. Must your light like mine be hidden? Your young life like mine be wasted, undone in mine, undoing and ruined by ruin, thirsty, cankered, goblin ridden. She clung about her sister, kissed and kissed and kissed her. Tears once again refreshed her shrunken eyes, dropping like rain after long sultry drought, shaking with, with anguish, fear and pain. She kissed and kissed her with a hungry mouth. Her lips began to scorch, the juice was wormwood to her tongue. She loathed the feast, writhing as one possessed, she leaped and sung, rent all her robe and wrung her hands in lamentable haste and beat her breast. Okay, these are very sexually loaded images here. So she is licking the juice of her sister. Uh, once again, there are two interpretations here. One interpretation is that, of course, it's an example of homoerotic or lesbian love. Another interpretation is that Lizzie has offered her up as the redemptive Christ-like figure. Okay, so she has crucified herself and I've referred yesterday to my, uh, in my last lecture, sorry, I've referred to the uh, myth, uh, to the uh, tradition of Eucharism where uh, uh, the disciples, the Christians, the Catholics, they partake of the bread and the wine which is believed to be the flesh and blood of Christ. Okay, and Christ offers himself as a sacrifice. So there is an example, there's a reference of Eucharism also here in these lines. Okay. Uh, her hands in lamentable haste and beat her breast. Her locks streamed like the torch borne by a racer at full speed or like the mane of horses in their flight or like an eagle when she stems the light straight toward the sun or like a caged thing freed or like a flying flag when armies run. Okay. Swift fire spread through her veins, knocked at her heart, made the fire smouldering there, and overbore its lesser flame. She gorged on bitterness without a name. Ah, fool to choose such part of soul-consuming care, since failed in the mortal strife, like the watchtower of a town, which an earthquake shatters down, like a lightning-stricken mast, like a wind uprooted tree spud about, like a foam-topped water sprout, cast down headlong in the sea, she fell at last. Pleasure past and anguish past, is it death or is it life? Life out of death, that night long Lizzie watched by her, counted her pulses flagging stir, felt for her breath, held water to her lips and cooled her face with tears and fanning leaves. You'll see that now Laura will slowly recover. Okay, now she has eaten the fruit from the sister's body. She will slowly begin to recover. Okay. Uh, now, once again in the morning after she wakes up, her hair is no longer grey. It has got back its gleaming golden self, as you will see. Uh, Laura awoke as if from a dream, laughed in the innocent old way, hugged Lizzie but not twice or thrice, her gleaming locks showed not, not one thread of grey. Her breath was sweet as May and light danced in her eyes. Days, weeks, months, years afterwards, when both were wives with children of their own, their mother hearts beset with fears, their lives bound up in tender lives, Laura would call the little ones and tell them of her early prime, those pleasant days long gone of not returning time. Would talk about the haunted glen, that wicked quaint fruit merchant men, their fruits like honey to the throat, but poison in the blood. Men sell not such in any town, would tell them how her sister stood in deadly peril to do her good and win the fiery antidote. Antidote means the 
cure for the poison then joining hands to little hands would bid them cling together for there is no friend like a sister in calm or stormy weather okay so the poem ends with the two sisters telling their children about the poison of the goblin fruit about the world of experience about the world of um of the world of the goblin men okay so once again i told you this poem is subject to various interpretations i've already sort of tried to highlight them and i quickly tried to read through the poem of course there are limitations of these lectures if you have any questions kindly get back to me thank you so much